Uh, I'm going to be introducing here in just a minute um, Carl Guthrie with uh, MS Biotech, and uh, we'd like to thank them for being a sponsor today. Um, I think many of you would know Dr. Guthrie. He's a longtime ABC member. He's currently the chief commercial officer for MS Biotech. He received his DVM from Oklahoma State University and practiced in Nebraska for a while before embarking on a career in industry. Uh, Dr. Guthrie will be your MC for this evening and will be introducing the speakers. So uh, hang on and we'll have a great evening together. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to everybody on behalf of uh, MS Biotech. Uh, again, we wish we were in Amarillo tonight, but we're happy to be with you nonetheless, uh, virtually here as we work through the program tonight. Uh, briefly, what I'd like to do is uh, give you an overview of what we've got in store for you tonight. Uh, as Bob said, I will be the MC and I'll come on between the individual speakers and do introductions. But just a, a quick overview is the bulk of our program tonight is Dr. Jane Liedel is gonna talk about Megaspera Elsdenii and kind of a mode of action and the role it plays in the, uh, the rumen. And we'll follow that up with Dr. Mark Corgan, who's our technical director, who will talk about Lactopro use cases. And then last but not least, at the end, we'll have Tina Griman, our marketing director, that will talk about the new product innovations that we currently have with Lactopro. And what I would ask is everybody hold your questions to the end. If, if you'll go ahead and type them in as they occur, we'll try to assimilate them. And then after we get done with the presentation part, we'll assemble a panel and answer as many questions as we have time for. Uh, with that in mind, let me give you just a brief background on MS Biotech. It's a privately held company that's based out of Wamego, Kansas. And for those of you that don't know where, where Wamego is, it's actually about 12 miles east of Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, they've been in business there for roughly 10 years. They work on anaerobic bacteria. And the main bug which, which we produce is Megaspera elsdenii. It's got a well-known mode of action, and Dr. Liedel will talk in more depth tonight about that. The product has currently been on the market in the US roughly for 10 years. And for those of you that, that aren't sure, it's not classified as a drug, it's actually a probiotic, and it's classified in the DFM or direct fed microbial class, even though it's uh, presented in a drench today. We also have a capsule coming. Tina will tell us more about that later. And those type of products are actually reviewed by the FDA, the CDM version of that. And uh, like all DFMs, it comes with a letter of no objections and not a physical claim. So that is a difference that I wanted to point out off, uh, at the beginning. The other thing I would state is that it is AFCO feed ingredient uh, definition approved. So it has that classification as well. Today, the product is currently marketed in the US, Australia, and South Africa. We're in the works for Canada and Brazil and Mexico coming soon. So the current products um, was initially launched as Lactopro, which was a high volume drench. That was succeeded by Lactopro Advance, which was a little lower volume. Both of those products had 14 day shelf life. Recently, there's been some new innovation and we've been able to freeze dry the product and that's led to Lactopro NXT and Lactopro FLX. And those are the new products that are coming by the end of the year and Tina will talk more about those as we go forward. Now with that, what I'd like to do next is I'm gonna show you a short video. Uh, it does a nice job of giving an overview of the company and I apologize because it's a video, but it's only about four minutes long and it does a real nice job. So with that, I'll, I'll introduce the video. I am Leon, CEO of MS Biotech. I'm so proud that we are celebrating 10 years of business growth and sales of Lactipro in the US. I first became aware of Megasphere Alstina in 2003 while working in South Africa. The bacteria and its ability to reduce lactic acid in the rumen was intriguing. Mega E has been my primary focus for the last 17 years. 
My team successfully launched our patented bacterial strain in South Africa. I believed in the potential for Mega E in the US market, so I began working with Dr. Jim Drillard at Kansas State University. I moved my family to the US and started the US MS Biotech production facility and lab in Wormingo, Kansas. There were many that said we could never commercially produce and sell an anaerobic bacteria with a short shelf life, but we proved them wrong. The US business has grown from one employee, me, to now providing for 57 employees and their families. The success of MS Biotech is a testament to their collective innovation, creativity, and hard work. Our first generation product was LactiPro, and the very first dose was administered to feedlot cattle in July of 2010. Our focus in the last 10 years has been research and continuous improvement. In April 2015, we launched the second generation product, LactiPro Advance, which offered the same benefits of LactiPro with half the range volume. Innovation continued and we filed a patent for freeze-drying Mega-E in 2017. No other company in the world has been able to freeze-dry an anaerobe for cattle on a commercial scale. Now in 2020, we are launching our third generation products, LactiPro FLX and LactiPro NXT. Both products provide the same efficacy and bacterial level as LactiPro Advance, but they are more convenient and easier for our customers to use and they offered 12 months of refrigerated shelf life from manufacturing. This is a significant improvement over the past shelf life of 14 days. LactiPro FLX is a small capsule that dissolves in the rumen. It is packaged in 25 head resealable zipper pouches and each capsule is individually sealed to maintain product quality. We offer three formulations of LactiPro FLX, dairy, feedlot and cap. LactiPro FLX is available for sale now. LactiPro NXT is a low volume drench in two package sizes. The product will be available in the fall of 2020 and can be used to drench dairy or beef cows, feedlot cattle and calves. I'm so proud of the team we have assembled to serve our customers. I'm passionate about LactiPro and Mega E. The product works and we are excited to take LactiPro to even more customers. Okay, next, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Jane Leadle. But before I do that, what I'd like to remind everybody briefly is that tonight, uh, what we've intended is kind of a broad brush overview of the company and the product. We're not gonna do a deep dive into individual trial data. We've got a lot of that on hand and we invite you to reach out and connect with us if you've got specific needs and we'd be more than happy to follow up with you afterwards uh, due to time commitments and share some of our individual data summaries with you. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Liedl, who's no stranger to this space. Uh, in the past, she's worked with various companies, uh, Upjohn, Chris Hansen, and has done a lot of work in microbiology, developing probiotic products. And for those of you that uh, support the Purple Power Cat Nation, she even spent a little time at uh, KSU Vet Med. So please help me and welcome Dr. Jane Liedl to tell us a bit about why Megasphera Elsdenii is important in the rumen and what function that it, uh, that it, that it does. Okay, Jane. Yeah, thank you very much, Carl. Appreciate that. I also want to extend my thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak with you tonight. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite rumen microorganisms, and I'd like the chance to help share a successful story on a direct-fed microbial. Um, this is truly the very first indigenous microbe that has been brought to market. And today, let me see, I need to, yeah, there we go, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the rumen microbiome and its biology. I know many of you are familiar with what goes on, but let me, uh, let me share my story. Um, there are a number of substrates, and of course the metabolic end products of the, of the substrate degradation are what serves as the host nutrition. In concentrate-based rations, we often run into some problems, mostly acidosis and the control of gut pH is really what matters most to get best animal performance. Megasphera elsdenii, or mega-E, as Leander was sharing, 
Um, it has a very unique discovery and mode of action. And I'd like to talk about its role in reducing acidosis and controlling gut pH, and particularly the one robust strain that is this, the commercial standout, which has been introduced as Lactopro. The rumen, the small intestine, the large intestine should be considered as an organ. Its functions require as much energy as the liver and are just as important to host health as the liver. So we've got two important things that are, that are basically pushing on our ruminant animals. The ruminant, the ruminant animal, however, <laughs> was uh, evolved grazing forages. These forages are very slowly fermented by the resident indigenous microbes on a continuing basis. And as I mentioned, their major end products are volatile fatty acids or VFAs, and they are acetate, propionate, and butyrate, I may also say acid, acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid as I go along. These are the building blocks for the ruminant and its nutrition and growth. Particularly propionic acid, you've heard this before, it's a three carbon unit. Two of those three carbon units make a glucose, which is essential for the animal's production in gluconeogenesis. But we don't raise our animals to market weight on forage feed. We feed them grain-based concentrate rations, just like we do chickens and pigs. Now, uh, that first compartment that the food enters is a fermentation vat, not a gastric stomach. So immediately, we have a divergence in metabolic uh, function. Gut fermentation significantly different from acid hydrolysis, as I'm sure you can appreciate, and must be managed through pH controlled in order to preserve health and performance of the animals. So what happens to the rumen microbiome when ruminants are fed these high concentrate diets? Well, in these three boxes, I'm sharing the basics. We've got starchy substrates coming in. They are easily fermented and rapidly converted to their respective acidic end products. As a consequence, gut pH decreases. And as you know, when you have a lower pH, it increases the passive ab absorption of these volatile fatty acids from the intestine into the animal. And by that, the, the passive absorption, the more acid, the faster it goes across into the animal's bloodstream. This, of course, will stress the animal's acid-base balance. And the normal pH control mechanisms are no longer adequate. Because it's not a very fibrous feed, there's very little or less uh, cud chewing. And because we don't chew the, the cud very much, there's not enough saliva to counteract the amount of acids that are being produced. So we have the rumen microbiome on grain. This is feast mode. I mean, these, these organisms are just going crazy. They love it. They eat as fast as their little metabolic pathways will allow. They use that energy for some very good things, like to make more of themselves. And within that replication, they have microbial protein synthesis, which the animal needs. Where we get into a little bit of a bind is now we have a different end product profile. Favors propionic acid, which I've already shared is a really good guy. You know, two of those make a glucose. But we also have a burden of lactic acid. But the organisms are going to just continue. They expend their energy, their ATP, to maintain their cellular uh, membrane integrity and to keep a difference between the inside of them and the outside environment. This takes a lot of energy, particularly as these acidic, acidic end products accumulate. And they, as I mentioned, can overwhelm the host acid-base balance. And of course, if the pH gets too low, this can even affect most of the ruminal organisms. These, cellul these cells will lice, and components then are free to disperse into the luminal compartment, particularly lipopolysaccharides, which of course can trigger an inflammatory response. Lastly, there's no long-term bacterial survival mechanism. Because the animal evolved on forage, the organisms inside the gut had no reason to expend any energy figuring out how they're going to survive to the next meal because everything was on a continuing basis. So when things go bad and the pH 
drops below five, we basically have nothing except those organisms that are the fittest to survive. And those guys can cause a great deal of problem for the ruminant animal. The number one feed management concern, of course, is acidosis, not a stranger to any of you. Acidosis is that metabolic syndrome in which the gut fermentation is altered and poised, and I call it on a knife edge, between balance and imbalance. Acute acidosis will happen when the cattle are very abruptly switched from forage to grain. Now, as rumen microbiologists, we often blame it on Streptococcus bovis. Yeah, it deserves a lot of the blame. However, <laughs> it's not the only one. Strep bovis grows very quickly. Its reproduction rate, how often it will go from a mother cell into two daughter cells, is about 20 minutes. So in an hour, you've got exponential growth already happening. Ordinarily, this is not a problem because they'll make acetate, which is a good thing. We need that for, for milk fat synthesis and for fats in general to keep membranes healthy and, and for other fats as well. We also have formate and ethanol, not bad, but what happens is the, the Streptococcus bovis will shift to a homolactic acid fermentation when these starches are present and basically it produces only lactic acid. I'll explain why in a minute. But it's not just Streptococcus bovis. The whole gut microbiome is involved in this acidotic cascade. Acute acidosis is, of course, the extra lactic acid that is accumulating and causing a marked and sudden decrease in ruminal pH. When the gut pH is acidic, we have a key enzyme that's basically sitting at the top of a branch point. That branch point is normally all you know basically directing traffic through the whole fermentation but this enzyme pyruvate formate lyase don't have to remember the name basically it gets inhibited when we have too much acid around and because of that we no longer can have organisms making acetate propionate butyrate they only make lactic acid so when a streptococcus bulbus hits this this pyruvate formate lyase and finds that it's inhibited it has no other metabolic option except to make lactic acid. Why? Because it needs something to regenerate its redox factors. It's just simple biology. Other bacteria are inhibited as well. And because of that, there's less competition for the substrate. And of course, those that are just feasting on the substrate are making more and more acid and lactic acid in particular. Now there's a group of organisms that we usually don't even think about because they're in the population probably 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 per milliliter of ruminal contents, and that is the ruminal lactobacilli. However, just like in silage, the lactobacilli are very active when the pH is really low, below 5, for example. And what happens is as the pH is beginning to decline up down to 5, it will overtake Streptococcus bovis and produce much more lactic acid and the, and the animal is in a world of hurt. So that downward spiral in ruminal pH is very difficult to reverse. Now acute acidosis has effects on the animal as well. When you have this lactic acid, of course, you know that it's 10x stronger than the volatile fatty acids that I've talked about. But that acid can cause this sloughing and scarring of the epithelium. You guys have your own favorite pictures of the, the bad rumen as it's been insulted by the acid load. This is often irreparable damage. And what happens is you can't absorb nutrients through this damaged tissue. And the host is trying desperately to heal it. So you've got a huge increase in host maintenance energy expenditure. And through these breaches, the bacteria will enter the host into the bloodstream and go everywhere, causing even more problems for the animal. The other point is when the lactic acid concentrations are very high, there's a tendency within any mammal for the, for the blood to help to ionically balance the, uh, the, the concentrations of minerals and, and charges from one side to the other. So what happens is in the ruminant animal, 
the water is pulled from the blood into the lumen of the intestine and it serves to dehydrate the blood which leads to hemoconcentration. Many animals die of this and the metabolic acidosis, which is as a cause. There's also subacute rumen acidosis if we didn't have enough problems. <clears throat> this occurs even in animals that are gradually adapted to grain feeding. They often have chronically low intestinal pH. The animals don't ruminate very much, <clears throat> they produce less saliva, they have a slower flu uh, fluid dilution rate. And what means what that means is the acids stay around longer inside the gut. Because absorption is passive along a gradient, all these acids contribute to the chronic condition, hence we call it subacute um, acidosis. So the intestinal wall is always under a acid insult. And this, of course, leads to a variety of maladies that cause a decrease in animal performance. The current acidosis management practices are all feed-based. We gradually change our newly arrived cattle to, from forage on which they were backgrounded to a concentrate ration. We may have three to five steps that may go over three weeks. These forage feeds are very bulky to store, they're hard to mix, and of course you have the logistics of handling multiple diets. Plus, once adapted, you've got to keep this feed intake as consistent as possible. Consistency is next to godliness. That's what I learned when I was trying to help you know, the, the, the producers out in the field. But we have mother nature against us in many factors. Because some animals are fast eaters, some are slow, some animals pick on one another. Then you have storms and weather pressure changes, which causes some animals to just stop eating. And then when they, you know, when the storm passes, they eat more, causing a problem. Some animals get sick. What do you feed them in the hospital pen? And then when they're okay, what do you feed them when they return to their home pen? And there's also other times like terminal processing when animals are in and out of the pens. So the bottom line is that producers have many, many challenges. So are there other tools in our toolbox? Currently, we use low level antibiotics in the feed. However, our industry is under huge pressure to remove antibiotics and other growth promoters, AGP, from livestock production. If we cannot use AGPs, can any commercially available direct fed microbials probiotics help us to manage the pH and the underlying acidosis as causes? Well, let's take a look. In this slide, I share basically a, a whole assemblage of the different kinds of things that the current DFMs do. And these are currently available. Some organisms, I'm gonna start on the, the lower right hand side, by their metabolism, they deconjugate bile, bile acids and bile salts. They may have enzymes that increase digestion. You may even have a, a DFM that has an amylase in, in it that would make more um, uh, nutrients available. Some metabolize different amines to reduce their toxicity. Others take the place of a organism that, you know, and may displace a pathogen. So we competitively exclude. We also have DFMs that are out there that stimulate the immune system. That's, that's a can of worms. However, we're, we're honing in on exactly what's going on there. We do see an increase in IgA and IgG in many of these uh, trials. Importantly, we need to scavenge the oxygen and keep the redox potential low. What does that mean? Well, when cattle are off feed, they have more air coming in because the fermentation keeps scrubbing the oxygen away, keeping it anoxic, which, is, and it's anoxic, it's the best for the animal. So when animals are off feed, we've got that as an issue because oxygen makes it possible for other pathogens and undesirables to get a toehold and become more competitive in the environment. Others may produce the antibacterial, you know, bacteriocins, for example, that are antimicrobial. But what I really want to draw your attention to is in the upper left-hand corner, this organic acids, whether we're producing and converting, 
this is really the key to managing pH in the rumen and in the entire intestine. Those organic acids, we need to produce what the animal needs because they're dependent on that microbial metabolism. And we need to take the bad guys, the lactic acid, and convert them back into host-friendly units. The end result then is at the bottom, improved microbial balance, host health, and host performance. The best known animal nutrition story in rumen microbiology is Megasphera elsdenii. It was isolated from the sheep rumen in England by Sidney Elsden way long time ago, 1953. It was called the large caucus. And then now because they, it's large, it's five times larger than ruminococcus, for example, hence the name mega. In the 1970s, we began raising, and it may even be before that, but we started raising our cattle in intensively managed feedlots. We soon learned that the management of gut pH, lactic acidosis and sera that I've already described, was critical. We also realized that the studies of well-adapted cattle, because there were some that just that didn't care. They could, they could be fed concentrate rations and uh, grains and showed very little ill effect. What we discovered is that those animals had higher levels of Megasphera elsdenii. They were shown to metabolize that problematic lactic acid and they shifted into propionic acid and butyric acids, two very critical VFAs. Many researchers focused their careers on this important organism and I'm one of them. I studied Megasphera a long time. Megasphera elsdenii is a member of the normal rumen microbiome. It's an anaerobe. It has a very versatile and hence very desirable metabolism. And in three, these three boxes, I kind of summarize what it does. It ferments lactic acid, which I've already shared, makes good quantities of acetate, butyrate, even propionic acid, and it ferments simple sugars as well. The indigenous Megasphera grow best when the pH isn't really too acid. Above 5.6, they do much better. And as I mentioned, most of the strains are very oxygen sensitive. The indigenous Megasphera have a population of about one times 10 to the six, about a million cells per milliliter of ruminal content. That's at the lower level of a threshold. The threshold that rumen microbiologists will tell you that it's just barely functional. You need organisms in higher numbers than that to really push a fermentation in a certain direction. The other thing we learned about indigenous megasphera is that they grow rather slowly. I mentioned Streptococcus bovis with a doubling time of 20 minutes. Most megasphera have a doubling time of well over two hours. So it doesn't, you can figure it out pretty quickly. So probiotic manufacturers have pursued Megasphera as a direct fed microbial for quite a long time. Most strains failed commercial development until it was discovered that we had Megasphera elsdenii NCIMB41125. <laughs> it's the most robust Megasphera elsdenii strain to date. It's active over a wide pH range. It rapidly multiplies in the rumen less than an hour to make a mother to two daughters and hence forth. It eats many different substrates. It's much less oxygen sensitive, so it allows for commercial development. It's compatible with ionophores because it's metabolically insensitive. The cell wall resists feed antibiotic activity and it's synergistic with the fermentation effects of other direct fed microbials and yeast additives. So the best tool in our toolbox today is Megasphera elsdenii 41125. I would say it's the critical lactic acid consumer in the rumen. If you can imagine this room being filled with lactic acid, this organism would have such a high affinity that it would grab up 80% of them and turn it over into the other host friendly end products. So it effectively converts the extra lactic acid produced by other bacteria into these host-friendly end products. And I want to specifically mention butyrate. 
butyrate is the main energy source for the enterocytes that line the intestine. Why is that important? Well, as I shared with you that the intestine lining is always under insult and it's not gonna change uh, because we're still feeding concentrates to our ruminant animals, but it increases the mitotic index. That means that each enterocyte lining the intestinal wall is ready to reproduce into new enterocyte cells. So that's what I mean when it's when the when the organism is making butyrate, it actually helps to heal the intestine by getting the enterocytes ready to reproduce so that the insult is healed. Megasphera Ehlers Denii 41125 can prevent the de development of lactic acidosis and its related metabolic problems. How does it do that? You inoculate a large amount as, as a dose or a bolus, and it boosts the population density of this critical organism to what I call the functional level. That means it is ready to participate as an organ in the intestine. It kickstarts the pH control process and it leads the fermentation in the right direction. In summary, I'm pleased to say that Megasphera Ehlers Denii 41125 is Lactapro. Use of this product makes the transition to concentrate rations possible in either fewer dietary steps or even one step. How does it do that? It stables, stabilizes the ruminal pH, reduces the acidic insult, and feeds the intestine with its production of butyrate. By doing so, it improves cattle health from the inside out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I appreciate the review on uh, rumen microbiology. I know for myself it's been some time and uh, I appreciate the, the update with that and the importance of lactic acid uh, and acidosis and Megasphera Elsdenii's role as it is a lactate utilizer. Next up, what I'd like to do is introduce our technical director, Dr. Mark Corrigan to let him talk to us about uh, various use cases where Lactapro is used today as we link that back to the mode of actions. Uh, Dr. Corrigan uh, did his undergraduate work at Kansas State, also got a master's degree there before he went on to Nebraska to get his PhD and has spent time with both uh, Lalamond and Merck recently in tech services. Please welcome Dr. Corrigan. Thank you, Dr. Guthrie, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lito, for the great information, and uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today about where um, we utilize Lactapro in both feed, feed yards and dairies. Um, as Dr. Guthrie mentioned earlier, um, if you'd like to see some of the more in-depth trial data that surrounds these use cases, please feel free to, to contact us, and, and we'll be happy to share those and go through those trials um, as necessary. So uh, we just heard from Dr. Lidl about um, how important Megasphera is in the ruminant animal. Um, and with that in mind, we have to understand there's a broad utility for the use of, of Lactapro. And so I'm gonna go through seven use cases tonight uh, places where Lactapro is utilized, again, in the feed yards and dairies. Really, as you look at these use cases, you can kind of uh, pair them into two different uh, scenarios. The first one is where we're uh, under normal production conditions. Uh, we're trying to alleviate a challenge that exists. And so, obviously, in that case, Lactapro is, is certainly not a suitable alternative to proper management of those cattle. But as we know with the, the production systems that we deal with, there are challenges uh, that exist from a, a rumen health and, and rumen metabolism standpoint. And the other one is, is with the, the knowledge that a lot of our man current management practices, especially from a dietary standpoint, 
are in place to uh, increase and manage the native uh, Megaspira populations in the rumen. Um, now that we know that we can deliver Megaspira uh, alive to the rumen in appropriate amounts uh, with Lactopro, it allows us to be able to manage those cattle um, in a way that's really more efficient and allows us to utilize our other resources um, where they can potentially help us uh, in other cases. So the first use case I'm gonna talk about is utilizing Lactopro in growing and receiving calves. Oftentimes when these cattle come into the feed yard, they may or may not have been weaned. They may or may not have, uh, have been exposed to a bunk before. So uh, with that in mind, with the stress associated with uh, transport and receiving, um, we can see inconsistent intakes in these cattle. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that even though these cattle are often fed a, a diet that's got 40% concentrate, if you measure lactate in their rumen, um, they'll actually have more lactate, uh, a greater lactate concentration in their rumen than an animal that's adapted to a, a full finishing diet. And that's just because um, through the adaptation process, um, the, the adapted animal is able to deal with the lactate that's produced, whereas these animals um, obviously are, are naive to, to those cereal grains and not able to do that. Um, another thing to be aware of uh, this year, especially as we talk about um, some of the challenges with supply of corn byproducts, um, those are utilized in a lot of growing and receiving rations particularly. Um, and, and those are some byproducts that we can utilize that don't have a lot, of, a lot or any starch in them, uh, but do contain a lot of energy. But with the uh, lower supply of those byproducts this year. Um, we've seen a lot of those, these growing and receiving diets switch to a, um, a greater concentration of cereal grains. And so in that instance, there's certainly a, a use for Lactopro. Um, but with this use case, um, we can really consider that the room and challenge exists without altering the diet or without altering management. It's just built into the, the production system. <clears throat> One use case where we can uh, potentially alter management is the use of it with accelerated diet transition programs. Um, we, our research has shown that we can uh, shorten that step up period by 50% or more. Um, that assumes that uh, we have proper bunk management at the yard and also uh, we have the proper cattle type. Um, if those cattle are gonna come to the bunk and eat, um, and we're not adapting them to the bunk, then uh, we can uh, obviously with Lactopro adapt the rumen very rapidly with that, the application of the product. And we've shown that there's a two to 3% improvement in feed efficiency um, that certainly has a, a uh, economic return uh, to those producers. But really, as we talk to people who utilize um, this sort of a program, they say where the greatest benefit they get is in the improved operational efficiency. So it helps them with mill capacity, with truck capacity, and, and also with labor capacity, which is really so important in today's world. Again, we can just simplify management of that step-up program and then utilize those, uh, those labor resources in other ways that uh, can be beneficial to the cattle and, and to the end line of those producers. Um, the use case where we've been most focused, I would say, over the last year or so um, is looking at the use of Lactopro at terminal processing. So whenever I say terminal processing, that can either be sorting cattle at the end of the feeding period to um, create more uniform marketing groups or re-implanting those cattle to ensure that we uh, maintain uh, improvements in feed efficiency that the implants give us. Uh, one challenge though with doing that is whenever we have those cattle on feed and they have a consistent intake and we pull them out of the pen, at times we'll see uh, disruptions in their feed intake patterns. And certainly this is uh, related to the stress that they uh, experience in terminal processing. So if we commingle those cattle with sorting, they have to reestablish the social hierarchy within the pen. Um, if it's done during a time of hot or very cold weather, that can exacerbate the challenge how long those cattle were out of the pen, did they miss the morning feeding, how long did they have to travel to the processing barn, just a myriad of factors that can add uh, together to a very stressful event. 
And what we've seen with our research is that those cattle given Lacapro at that time, uh, we can see performance and carcass quality uh, improvements, um, as well as effects on, on uh, mortality post-terminal processing. But the response is really gonna be related to the challenge. So if those cattle uh, have a big challenge, um, there's really a, a very good use for Lacapro in that, in that case. Um, one use case that kind of arose out of necessity is the use of Lactapro um, in down corn or corn stock raising where grain adaptation is not really possible or practical. Um, we don't have direct data on this, but the use case is really based on feedlot experience of cattle that are not adapted to cereal grain finishing diets. Uh, you know, the various grain challenge studies that we've done and then just experience where uh, you know, people were looking for an insurance policy where they had to turn cattle out or, or wanted to turn cattle out without, uh, a, they didn't feel like they were able to adapt those cattle uh, to the grain that they were going to eat out in the field. So, uh, moving from the beef to the, the dairy side of things, uh, Lactopro is also utilized in, in milk fed calves. So, uh, you know, very young Holstein calves or very young dairy calves in the hutch. Um, it's usually administered between day seven and 14. So that's roughly the time where those, those animals will start to consume concentrate. Um, you heard Dr. Liedel talk about the importance of butyrate production. Um, certainly it's, it's an important factor in rumen papillae growth and increase of the absorptive surface area of the rumen. Uh, butyrate is metabolized by the rumen wall and, and stimulates growth of those papillae. I mean, we have some very interesting data on that in, in both dairy calves as well as uh, coal cows. And what we've shown is that those cattle given Lactopro are um, more, their willingness to consume more concentrate that, that occurs earlier um, in their life. And so we're able to increase the energetics of those animals just through intake. Um, and also whenever we looked at ad libitum milk intake, those cattle, those calves actually consume, voluntarily consume less milk. Um, and, and we've also shown uh, that really the use at day seven to 14 can set them up uh, post weaning for improve, improved intake and, and growth. So and moving on to the dairy cows, as we look at uh, the transition cow, um, Lactopro, in that case, is administered three days post-calving. Um, so after calving, those cows are being adapted to a different diet. They're going from a dry cow ration to a lactation ration. Um, there's also obviously intake challenges associated with calving and the stress that's associated with it. And so a lot of, in a lot of cases, we have to, um, in a lot of cases, we have to manage those transition cows to get them ready for peak lactation. And certainly it has utility in all dairies, but particularly in the small to medium sized dairies where they have challenges um, manufacturing multiple diets and, and uh, managing those, those cows through a complex transition program. You know, the utilization of Lactopro where they're not able to, to maybe take all the management steps, that's, that's a use case where it's uh, very successful. And then finally, um, the utilization of Lactopro in sick cattle or in hospital cattle. Um, you know, as we talk about sick cattle, uh, I heard the comment was made by Dr. Lechtenberg last night about uh, whether or not an animal is really sick of respiratory disease or if that animal might be experiencing acidosis um, because the clinical signs of those two ailments can, can certainly um, look very similar. Um, also, you know, whether we're talking about acidosis or uh, respiratory disease or some other ailment, we know sick cattle just quit eating. And so if we've got an animal that was adapted to a concentrate diet, but it gets sick and doesn't consume feed for one or two or three days, um, you can imagine what happens to its native megasphere populations. Um, and so in that case, certainly the utilization of Lactopro is, is warranted. Um, the other case around sick cattle and hospital cattle is whenever we put those cattle in a hospital pen and back them up a couple rations, so increase the roughage level in their rations. Um, whenever we ask those cattle to go back to their home pen 
and, and uh, compete with their pin mates who are healthy and also ask them to eat that finishing ration again. Um, you know, it's utilized in that case where we're sending cattle home to that environment um, just to give them an extra boost and, and a little more help. So to summarize, again, uh, there's just a broad utility of megasphere. It's so important to ruminant animals, but you can think about it really from the true two principles. So if there's a current challenge that we can't alleviate through management, uh, you know, certainly Lactapro would have uh, use there if that challenge is related to uh, rumen lactate and just rumen health. Um, but it's also a tool that allows us to manage cattle in a way that otherwise wouldn't be possible. We can simplify management programs and so uh, make sure that our adherence to those management programs uh, is greater. So from a use case I, uh, scenario, I gave you seven use cases from receiving calves and growing calves, accelerated uh, and finishing transition, uh, terminal processing, so either sort or terminal implant or both, um, crop cereal grain residue, uh, grazing on the dairy side, um, you know, as we talk about dairy calves pre-weaning, uh, certainly from a rumen development standpoint, it's uh, a good use case for Lactapro, transition dairy cows, and then finally hospital cattle or sick cattle. Um, so with that, I, I give it back to you, Carl. Thank you, Mark. Uh, appreciate going over the various use patterns. And again, I would uh, tell the group, uh, please feel free to reach out afterwards if you'd like additional information. There's quite a bit of trial data on nearly every one of these, not every one, but we'd be happy to share in more detail. And so now that I want to transition to Tina Griman. Tina is our marketing director and uh, Tina is no stranger to the industry. Uh, you may have known her from some of her previous roles. She spent time with uh, Elanco, VetLife, uh, and Syntex in her earlier career, and most recently uh, spent time with KG Market Sense. And Tina's gonna talk to us about uh, the Lactapro products that are available today in, in the various SKUs. Tina? All right, thank you, Dr. Guthrie. I, uh... Thank you to the AVC for having us uh, as part of your meeting this evening. It's a great opportunity to speak with all of you and we really appreciate it. And I get the, the great job of wrapping up the discussion here at the end, talking about two new product innovations, which is always really exciting. So before I get into the new product innovations, we've touched a little bit on the fact that our current product is Lactapro Advance. It's a high volume drench. It has a 14 day shelf life from manufacturing we will be discontinuing this product at the end of the year. And the thing that allows us the opportunity to discontinue Lactapro Advance is our ability to freeze dry Megasphera elsdenii. And that was touched on in some of the earlier discussions as well. So MS Biotech has been spending the last seven years working from the scientific side on research and development and also on the production side to figure out how to freeze dry an anaerobic bacteria, put it into a live but a suspended state uh, so that it has better utility in the feed yard on the dairies. So the freeze dried megasphere that we've developed has extended shelf life. It's 12 months from the date of manufacturing. From a practical standpoint, by the time we produce the product and actually get it in the field, there will be eight to 10 months of shelf life on the product once it hits the marketplace. It does require refrigerated storage to maintain the viability of the Megasphera over a long time. And we'll talk about um, two of our, our product forms that we're going to be launching that we're really excited about. Lactapro NXT is a low volume drench and Lactapro FLX is a small capsule that you can administer. Think of it like a very small bolus. And we'll talk about each of these. So Lactapro NXT has very unique packaging. It's got dual chamber packaging that separates that anaerobic bacteria from the rehydrant. So the upper right hand part of the, of the packaging has an anaerobic chamber where the freeze dried mega E lives and the rehydrant fills up the rest of the pouch. And there is a seal that separates the mega E from the rehydrant. In order to activate the bag, you put pressure on the rehydrant portion right in the middle, you push up towards the seal, 
and that will break the seal between the bacteria and the rehydrant. You shake it gently to mix it. The activated product is milky in color, so it's very easy to tell what it, when it is activated and ready to use. And the product needs to be, once it's rehydrated, needs to be used within 18 hours. So if you're processing cattle, you've got some product left at the end of the day, you can put it in the refrigerator and then take it out the next morning and use it to work cattle again. But if it's not used within 18 hours, it does need to be discarded. So this is a picture, the, the unique part of our packaging is that the bottom gusset, when you flip the pouch over, is clear. So you can see into the bag and see the, the fact that the rehydrant is clear. When the product is activated and it's mixed, it turns a milky color and visually it's very easy to tell that that product is ready to use and ready to go. To use the product itself, um, the packaging already has a spout on it. It's what we call a fitment and there's a locking connector that clicks into that and you would hook that connector to the hose of a drench gun and there is a grommet in the bottom right hand corner of each bag so you can hang it up on the chute or wherever you're processing cattle. So it's all ready to go, very easy to use. We do provide a 20 ml metal drench gun. It's very high quality, uh, really easy to use and very, very durable as well. And we provide those with the product. Lactopro NXT can be used to drench feedlot cattle, dairy or beef cows or calves. And the volume that you give is dependent on the animal type that you happen to be working because we're targeting a specific number of CFUs per head. So for feedlot cattle, the drench volume is 20 mLs. For cows, it's 40. For calves, it's 10. We have two different pouch sizes. We have a 200 mL pouch and a larger size, which is 1,000 mL. So for feedlot cattle, small pouch does 10 head, large pouch does 50. Okay. The other product that we're launching is called Lactopro FLX. And this is the very small capsule that you see pictured here down in the bottom part of the screen. And Lactopro FLX delivers the same number of CFUs as what you get in the drench. It's just contained in a very small capsule. It's about an inch and three eighths in length. It is a number 12 gelatin capsule for those of you who, who think of it in that way. Um, it's, it's small. It comes in a zipper resealable pouch. There's 25 capsules per pouch. And each of the capsules is individually sealed to maintain it in that anaerobic environment and protect the product and maintain product quality. So you can see the capsules pictured here in the bottom. We do provide a customized metal applicator or balling gun that works very well. The capsule clicks into the top to hold it in place so it doesn't fall out as you're administering it to cattle. And what we found is our dairy customers especially really, really like the Lactopro FLX. Drenching cattle is difficult on a dairy, it's not something they're used to doing like many feed yards are. So the Lactopro FLX capsule is a great fit. And the, the feedlot version of the Lactopro FLX capsule has been really popular among um, in sick pens because they can just take however many they need. They don't have to rehydrate product and discard anything. So they can just use the capsules as needed, pull them out of the fridge and, and use them. We do, as I've mentioned, three formulations, and we know that it's important, especially in an operation like a dairy that might be working cows and also administering it to calves, that the workers can visually tell the products apart. So the dairy product has a green oval, the calf product has a blue oval, the feedlot product has a teal oval. So you can visually tell the difference between them. And then also the foil pouches on the dairy product and the calf product, which are likely to be used in the same operation are different color. Cow is silver, the calf is white. So you can very visually and quickly identify the difference between those products if they happen to get taken out of the pouch. So the Lactopro FLX, all forms are available for sale right now. We launched the product in early June and it's going very well. We get great feedback from customers. Lactopro NXT, the drench, we are doing a soft rollout to a targeted number of customers, not to test the product, but more to just um, work with our customers on how to make that transition from Lactopro Advance to the NXT, get them used to storing it in the refrigerator, and just helping us learn 
and address all those little things that can come up when you launch a new product. And that soft launch enables us to address those so that when we're ready to full launch in the fourth quarter of this year, we have all of those little sticky things worked out and we're ready to fully go. Um, we sell direct uh, to customers. We do not sell through distributors. And we wanted to give you a general cost per head idea for uh, feedlot cattle is $3 per head. And this is general. If you wanna talk more specific, uh, drop me an email or give me a call. Dairy cows, $6, $2 for calves. And uh, with that, you know, we, we all really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. All of our emails are listed in this presentation. So if you'd like to follow up with me specifically about any product or marketing questions, uh, drop me an email, let me know what Dr. Liedel, Dr. Guthrie, Dr. Corrigan, as we've mentioned, if you wanna talk about the data in more depth, those are your contacts, go to each one of those individually. And if anyone is interested in ordering, um, our email is here, our, our phone number is also available for MS Biotech customer service. Bree and Cindy uh, will take care of you should you need anything else. So with that, I will turn it back to Carl for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate the review on the products. Uh, now, if uh, Mark and Jane will come back on, I've got a few questions here and I'll just start with uh, kind of reading them out. And the first one, Mark, I'm gonna send to you. And it's basically how critical is the timing of administration to the onset of acidosis? So I think a bit maybe on duration. Uh, in other words, does administration at the feedlot arrival result in declining population levels over time that drop below a protective level if acidosis risk peaks later in the period? In the period. Okay. Um, to answer that question, I'm going to utilize some information that was produced at Kansas State, um, looking at uh, measuring megasphere populations in the rumen of cattle given uh, different levels of lactopro, including control. Uh, if you look at our current uh, rate that we apply the product at, um, those cattle increase megasphere populations by one log within two hours, um, by two logs within six hours, and then by three logs within 24 hours. Um, and so, you know, if we talk on log scale, obviously, after 24 hours, you have a thousand times as much of the bug in the rumen. Um, and, and they were able to maintain those populations in the rumen uh, that for a period of time, they were higher than what the control cattle were once they were fully adapted to the concentrate diet. They dropped back down to on par with where those uh, control cattle were after a few weeks and, and maintained that population uh, for several weeks after that. So um, from the standpoint of how long does it, you know, last in the room and quote unquote, uh, once it establish a, is establishes a population, uh, I would say it, it appears several weeks. One caveat that I would throw in, in there is if those cattle go off feed for a substantial amount of time, um, I could argue that we remove the substrate and so going off feed may have a, an issue as far as just overall megasphere populations if we remove that lactate substrate. Uh, but Dr. Lito, I, I'm sure you have anything to add or any? any oh, I, uh, yeah, I think you were right on, on the money. In terms of inoculating the, the rumen of these cattle, yeah, you're giving a bolus dose. These organisms are alive at the get-go so what you just shared about it multiplying, because this particular strain is not just confined to fermenting lactic acid, it, it can eat basically anything that's otherwise available to the, in the animal. So all of what you shared, you know, there's a good platform for its continued health, growth, and replication. And as I, and you're using other words, but I talked about a functional level and you're giving a, you know, you're leading the fermentation with that bolus dose of, of megasphera and it's then multiplying on its own. So it's really at a very functional level, pulling that fermentation in the right direction, getting those animals so that they can adjust more quickly. And they often do, um, much to our surprise, it's, it's really a very interesting uh, history 
history that, that we've generated in, in all of these trials, um, because it is a truly amazing organism and it helps to put those animals on feed very quickly. Um, and as you said, uh, when you have other problems, you know, the animals off feed, it's, it's like I shared about, you know, the feast and then the famine, you're going to have some other issues, but Megasphera will remain there. And once you reintroduce feed, um, it will eat whatever is available and continue to do uh, what it's metabolically capable of doing. Of course, if you're putting in the hospital pen, you have to understand also that you're treating that animal. And, and many times that you know, that sometimes could cause some ruminal conditions that, uh, you know, as you've already addressed in your presentation. So the hospital pen, and then what do you do when the animal goes back to the home pen? Um, another dose of Megasphera, your Lactopro seems, uh, seems the appropriate treatment. Thank you, Dr. Liedl. Okay, the next question, uh, Tina, I'm going to send it your way. Uh, in a crop residue grazing scenario, how's the product being fed or which product form is being used? Okay, so historically, um, last year, there was a huge problem with down corn, especially through areas of Kansas and Nebraska, and our customers would use Lactopro Advance as a drench formulation, so it is not being put into the feed administered to those cows going out on down corn or grazing crop residue, it's administered as a drench. Um, so if they're running those cows through the chute in any way, that's the way they're administering it. This year with the launch of the capsule and also the NXT, it's really the producer's choice if they want to drench those cows um, or if they want to administer the capsule. It, it, it really depends on what works best for that particular operation but it is not being fed in the feed. Okay, thank you, Tina. Now, Mark, I'll go back to you. Uh, any studies on effect of disinfecting administration equipment between animals? Hey, yes, we uh, did some in-house work looking at uh, disinfecting the, I'll, I'll call it the wand on the, on the uh, at that time, Lactopro Advance, um, the drenching wand. Um, so just the tip, dipping it into a disinfectant solution. So they use chlorhexidine, um, also used uh, Clorox bleach, um, and showed no uh, difference in viable cell counts after having done that. Uh, now, obviously, there's always concern about uh, what those disinfectants, what their effect might be on a viable organism. But uh, I think we concluded that just based on on the fact that the contact with the disinfecting solution is, is minimal in that case. Um, it, it didn't have any effect on the subsequent uh, administration of the drench on the, on the cell counts of, of that, uh, that application. So. Okay, good. Um, Tina, I'm gonna go back to you with this one. Uh, what about organic approval for use? Okay, we technically do not have organic approval on Lactopro. Um, that is, the, the product is natural. Obviously, it's a natural ruminal bacteria as Megasphera alsdenii, but there are some things that are used in the production process that may not qualify necessarily for the organic approval. And so we, we do not have that at the present moment. Gotcha. And I'm going to hit you again. Well, I got you, Tina, a question on the shelf life of the capsules, assuming that's also eight to 10 months as well. Correct. Those are also 12 months from the date of manufacturing. So again, right now, based on our manufacturing flow, the product that is going out in the field is between eight to 10 months of dating. And then one last question, uh, Bob, and I promise I'll wrap it up and send it back to you. Uh, Mark, this one will go to you. Does the administration of mega E at calving and dairy cows help to reduce the incidence of uh, DAs? If so, how much? Yeah, um, we don't have any. Uh, we don't have any research data that uh, where we can give you a, 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 that Lactopro reduces the incidence of displaced abdomen. So, uh, we at this time we don't have any information that would suggest it does. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate everyone the questions and the uh, attention for the presentation tonight. And again, I would encourage you, if you think of additional questions over time, 
please re reach out, email, and, and contact us, and we'd be more than happy to visit more with you uh, going forward. Bob, I'll hand her back to you. All right. Well, thank you, Carl, and, and thank you to all, all the folks there at MS Biotech. Thanks, uh, Carl, Jane, Mark, and Tina. Uh, excellent presentation. We really appreciate your, your time this evening.